So hello everyone and thank you for being with us today. We have right now one amazing guest speaker with us, Laura Pauker. Hi Laura, how are you? Hello there, how are you today? I'm great. We are very, very happy to have you on board for our second day of the live sessions, part of the Eventix B2B March 2024 event. Uh, so Lara is going to speak with us today on a very, very important topic about building, supporting and protecting tomorrow's exhibitions and event industry workforce. So Lara, we cannot wait to hear all of the insights that you have to share with us on this amazing and also very important topic about the industry. Well, thank you very, very much. And I am I'm honored to be here to talk about this because you know, when I first uh, started thinking about rebuilding the workforce here in the United States, I wanted to run out and just say, we've got great jobs because just in the uh, the trade show vertical, we lost over 3 million people. And, you know, you don't really think about what that entails until you start really digging in deep. So a few things that happened, and I'd like you to relate this to your own communities. One is we found that we were far more invisible than we realized. Not only uh, did our friends and families not understand what we did, but we further found as uh as there was financial aid going into different industries in the United States, that we didn't have an AICS code. Um, and that's a North American Industry Classification Code. Then we started to really dig into, well, what do these codes mean? And we found out that there's an entire underlying code system in the United States that we literally, number one, didn't understand, didn't know, and weren't a part of. And uh, we're going to delve into some of those things today. But here's some other things that came up. In Las Vegas, Nevada, they lost 17,000 educators. Why did they lose 17,000 educators? You would think, oh, they must have retired. They must have pivoted and found a different, uh, a different career path. But in reality, a large portion of that loss was because the people in exhibition and events weren't working and the teachers were their spouses. So they needed to move out of these geographic areas to be able to find work so that they could survive, so that they could put food on the table. And so we really don't understand the real impact that our industry has in our communities and in our in uh, our, our areas. We just think about, oh, ticket sales, or we think about how we're giving more work to the, the Uber drivers or the Lyft drivers or the hotel bellmen or, or the restaurants. And we really are a part of everyone's life, their lifestyle and their communities. And I think that brings to point the urgency that we need to think about what is the risk if, if our industry is hurt? What is the responsibility that we have as we start to recruit and rebuild our workforce? What are the opportunities for entrepreneurial uh, endeavors as we start to plan here in the United States for the next wave of catastrophic impact? And that's that's retirement. I mean, the average age of the worker in our industry in the United States was 53 to 58 years old with 20 to 30 years experience. So on the surface, you go, oh, my goodness, you know, how are we going to replace that on a dime? And then two is how are we going to uh, handle the next wave in five years when those people who are now business owners are going to start to retire? So we're going to take a look at this system 
and it's in the United States. However, as we've talked to our friends and colleagues across the world, we found that there are similar type of programs in, in other countries. So in this presentation, we are going to explore critical aspects of workforce development and how they are essential for building a prosperous future. We'd like to discuss the significance of the coding system in the United States, ONET codes, and also the significance of career and technical education. We'll talk a little bit about that and how we're able to utilize these systems to rebuild our workforce. And then also Department of Labor registered apprenticeship programs. These are uh, work uh, on the job training programs that are supported by the United States government uh, through their training in Department of Labor, Department of Education, and um, how we're utilizing these programs to shape our workforce, to provide a roadmap, to create an exhibition and events NAICS code. So we're we're trying to uh, create a multi-layered approach uh, because those of us that are in the exhibition and events industry, we know how to multitask. And when I first started to develop these programs uh, with our board of directors, everyone said, oh my goodness, this is a huge undertaking. And I just turned and I said, you know, we're up for the task. We build cities in two or three days and take them down in a day and move them, move them around the world. So um, I am I am privileged to be amongst my my colleagues and my peers. And um, and let's talk a little bit about what we're gonna do. So the first time that I got on the show floor after the pandemic, um, as is my usual character and style, is to be very customer centric. And I think that's a common theme throughout our industry. And I saw a person standing in the middle of a booth build and twiddling his thumbs as it appeared and looking a little lost. And I went to my city manager and I said, what's this person doing in my booth? You know, we, ha we have to have performance, uh, especially now because everyone has spent so much more money on getting the job done. And the supervisor said to me, he's brand new. Well, the first thing I said was, oh my goodness, why didn't you tell me that? We needed to be transparent and communicate that. This could have been a much different experience. We could have had a mind shift and thought about the worker, talked, uh, uh, paired him up in a mentoring situation, uh, been able to look at at how do we we create a welcoming environment so they'll want to come back because we need to rebuild our workforce. And the answer I got was no one wants to pay for somebody who's not skilled. I immediately looked and said, we've got to get that out of our head because everyone's going to have to pay for rebuilding our skill sets, rebuilding our workforce. So we need to change again that mindset look at the paradigm shifts that are caught are affecting our industry around the world and uh invest in our workforce invest in our communities and for us in the united states recognizing that our people are the livelihood are the success of our industry and that our industry really impacts the world and our nation. So let's explore uh, the ONET code. You know, I started looking uh, for imagery uh, for doing presentations uh, around the country. And I found this particular uh, image, which really hit home for me. And I think, you know, we work a different way. We, our industry workers work outside the box. We we work really hard and, and long hours when it's necessary. And we get to have a, a couple of days of rest in between, um, but it's not a hobby. 
we fall in love with the work that we do. And it is a 20 plus career and we are a viable industry. So it's worth understanding each of our country's systems that will not only rebuild our workforce, but will protect our workforce from ever experiencing what happened to us during the pandemic across the world ever again. So in the United States, that starts with ONET codes. And ONET codes are created uh, by the Bureau of, of Labor Statistics, and they are used as a data point for so many things in the country. They are used to create analytics for census bureaus and being able to analyze uh, the workforce. They're utilized most importantly by our Department of Education to be able to create course curriculum in our schools. So, you know, here in the United States, we always wondered why nobody knows about our jobs. Why, you know, you you find toys for babies, for police officers, for nurses, for construction workers, and you find in the school system different uh, different skill sets that are developed for these trades, but nobody knew about our trades. Well, that's because our jobs aren't don't have ONET codes, and we're changing that. A uh, career and technical education. It's a program that is in the United States that bridges skill set development and bridges course curriculum with academic endeavors and industry with workforce development. And it's called career and technical education. So once I started to learn about this right away, uh, we got very much involved uh, with the Exhibition and Events Workforce Development Federation. We got very much involved with CTE. Um, we we actually were invited to participate in a uh, in a program in the United States, which was to modernize the career cluster framework for schools. So if you take a look at, again, uh, our industry sectors, everybody always told a majority of our workers pick something close because in, in the United States, our sectors and in industry are hospitality, culinary, and tourism. And there are two subsections of that. One is in accommodations and food service, and the other sector is in arts, entertainment, and recreation. Did anybody hear events in any of that? No. So we wanted to take a huge step in, in becoming visible. And uh, two of my colleagues, uh, one is the executive director of Music Forward, uh, where it's worked with Live Nation in the United States, uh, Nareet Smith, and myself, we got on committees to modernize the career cluster frameworks. And I am following up with Nareet uh, in the coming weeks to, uh, to see her accomplishments. But I know that I was able to put an emphasis on events um, in the career cluster framework and got bold and told them they should rename it our sector to um, hospitality, events, culinary, and tourism. And so that proposal is going to the governing bodies for approval, and we hope that we can report good success with that. But another thing that we found is in uh, the federal government, uh, with the training component of our government, that there is a Department of Labor registered apprenticeship program. Now, this is an uh, on the job training program where we know that our entire industry has to bring new people in. Well, it's a program where if they uh, put those new people in the registered apprenticeship program, we can actually go and create. ONET codes faster. So I'm super excited. Um, we were uh, we uh, put in an application to be a group sponsor uh, that allows us in the state of New York to be able to create apprenticeship programs. 
The first ONET code that we established was for coordinator, but what we wanted to do is to, to be all inclusive. So we said coordinator, and then in parentheses, it says exhibitions, uh, trade shows, exhibitions, conferences, meetings, and events. So that anyone in our industry can hire somebody for the coordinator position, an entry level position, put them into a 4,000 hour curriculum and be able to um, give them a foundation where they can go into many career paths. They could go in, they could uh, graduate from the apprenticeship program and take an advanced course in or, or a college curriculum. They can take their apprenticeship program and they can go and they can uh, then further uh, go into an association or go into a small business or go into a large corporation or work for a general contractor. It allows them a career path for many, many, many different, um, different uh, ways to the top of the mountain. So, we wanted to recognize that the ONET codes are the keys to unlocking the potential for our work code force because it gives us a common language for our world of work. It identifies the skills required for different jobs. It help, helps us to navigate career journeys to find a perfect fit. So to this point in the work, we partnered with a company called U-Science. They are in 7,000 high schools across the country and they create job description cards. And then they've filtered that into an algorithm and created brain games. So students can go in, do the brain games, look at their academic uh, achievements and their interest and be paired with the best fitting career paths. Now, why is that exciting to us? It's exciting to us because last year they collected data from over 1 million students in the United States. And in that partnership with them, the co-founder, spoke at our Exhibitor Live conference here in the United States, and he said, the talent is there. So all we hear about in the news is about millenniums this and millenniums that and millenniums this. The good news is, is that the talent is there for our workforce, for crafting our future. And the ONET codes are, again, utilized in the career and technical education, but now they're also being uh, integrated into the training with the Department of Education, Department of Labor. And so as we start to open up these doors, we begin to build awareness about our industry and about our people so that we can protect our people should another catastrophe happen. Um, you know, how many of us just landed in this industry by mistake? I know I did. I was running a networking industry for creating a, creating um, masterminds for small business organizations. And uh, one of our, our members owned an exhibit house that lost the AT&T account. So that was about $6 million overnight and was trying to survive. And I went in and I was hired to do a reorganization. And in two years we were profitable. And then I drank the Kool-Aid and the rest is history. Uh, three decades later, still in this industry, still having a very successful company and embarking on a new career to rebuild our workforce, but not just to rebuild it, but to show people how they can re-enter the workforce and how our industry is viable to provide veterans programs in the United States for our program. Their skill sets are, are a perfect match. And then also uh, to work with the school systems and making sure that we are no longer invisible, but that people know about the great opportunities that we have and the welcoming environment that we bring to the table. The Department of Labor Registered Apprenticeship Program, we're now setting up for four more apprenticeships. Uh, one will be on uh, account management, 
another on uh, warehouse specialist, another on on-site supervisors, and the last will be on a um, on logistics. So we'll be able to create those curriculums. And for the student, it's great because any hours that they put in are transferable. Um, so they can take them with them wherever they go. Uh, and they can pick up their studies. The Department of Labor has been super flexible with us in saying that, you know, we can put an apprentice in an exhibit house. We can put an apprentice uh, in the next quarter with an event company. We can put them with uh, a staging crew. We can put them uh, in with, uh, with a strategic planner or a marketing focus for the next quarter. So their hours can be a mix of skill sets and we have a, a standardized onboarding process so that we can uh, show companies how their skills are transferable so that they can expand their businesses. And so there's just an unimaginable list of possibilities that this model can bring to the table. Now let's talk about even what's happening with our industry. I mean, AI. We're talking about automation. We're talking about advancements in LED screens and videos and hybrid events and all of these things that that really are so exciting because, you know, when, when we wake, wake up fully from this pandemic and the impact it had, we have the best minds in the world in our industry. I am looking so, I, I'm just super excited about the innovations that are to come, the the inventions, the the new ways of, of doing what we did, because it was a shakeup. It truly was a shakeup that we experienced. But I think the outcomes of that shakeup are going to create a whole new a whole new view of how do we engage people? How do we create experiences for individuals? How do we, how do we really change the world for the better? And that's where we get into uh, building for the future, um, integrating ONET codes, modernizing career and technical education programs, promoting apprenticeships, um, building a workforce for tomorrow that can thrive, but that will be protected from the invisible nature of our industry and that we will never again uh, be in a situation where, where our people are left alone and, and with a lack of communication. Through the Exhibition and Events Workforce Development Federation, we have our board of directors, we have our advisory council, we have a network of anyone in the individual, in the industry, whether an individual or an organization or association, it's free click to connect. We put out what's up Wednesday every month and it's a, it's a cliff notes. It's a, a summary, executive summary, or a, I can't say executive because it's for all of us boots on the ground to executives of what's going on in the industry. If something catastrophic ever happens again to us, um, we are going to make sure that our people are connected. So I'm Laura Palker, and thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, for your presentation and all the insights you just provided. So now it's time for questions. So if anyone has a question for Laura and her presentation, you can use the chat to ask her. Uh, while we wait for any questions, there is one that popped up, popped up in my head while I was listening to your presentation. Do you think that there are enough mentors who are ready to guide uh, new and young people who are joining the workforce? And if not, why would that be? What would the challenges be? So there's a couple of things with mentorship. Um, Every one of our apprentices will go through a training program that is uh, that is specific to customer service and leadership. Yeah. Uh, because every time that you get somebody who's in the in the industry 
that's new. Once they've got six months under their belt, they can start mentoring. Also, many of the people who had retired or who had left the industry, while they're not in a position to come back, still have an eagerness to volunteer. And so we can utilize that brain, you know, value and have volunteer programs for people who want to come and mentor. And it can be done virtually now. So that creates an exciting opportunity for a worldwide uh, movement of mentorship. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we already have one more question and people are amazed by the session. So the question is, hello, Lara. Thank you for the great presentation. What do you think are the main qualities that the people going going into the events industry should possess? So uh, uh, in a terrible accent, I'll say a joie de vie. You know, it is it is life, it is it is I don't think that a, a lot of our people in our industry you know, work or or live our lives inside of a box. We explore, we're imaginative, we think about possibilities. Um, many of us are able to, to kind of take a look at complex situations and reduce them to the ridiculous and then organize them and, and find a pathway forward. We're really good with solutions. Um, I think that that those are some of the innate qualities that make for a good candidate for our industry. And the other things uh, can be learned. You know, if if you love something and you find that you have, you do an assessment and you find your strengths and your weaknesses, you can build upon your strengths, but we can train on weaknesses. And I think that um, if if I'm not mistaken, I learned everything that I know in the past 30 years from my peers and my colleagues. Um, you know, when the Department of Labor was looking for an advisory committee to the Secretary of Labor, I applied and I said, I fit, I fit everything that America's labor uh, initiatives are trying to accomplish. I was a single mother when I first got in the industry. I learned every step of the way to uh, learn this business and to become proficient. And then I got to advance my skills, my earnings, and I bought a home. And then I was able to put my child through college. I mean, what more could you ask for? That is, that's what we aspire to do. And it was this industry that gave me that opportunity. And what about the, the pressure and how you how you manage to handle the stress or do you think that's something that comes with the experience and with more and more practice that you gain in, in this industry because let's face it that's a very stressful and hard industry so i think that we have to we have to look at again it's a the mind shift we have to look at life work balance so it's important for us to make sure that we're we've got a good health and wellness uh, regimen in our, in our lives and that we learn to breathe. For me, I play golf. So I look at when I, when I have a plan to have my shot land in the middle of the fairway and it ends up in the side, in the bushes, what is my, what is my solution? When I'm in, when I'm competing in tournaments, my most important my most important skill set is breathing. So learning to breathe is is critical for managing stress. Yes. Yeah. And you know, and that balance again, very important. If you've if you're going to be on the road and doing a 35 hour set, you have to make sure that when you get home that you have, you know, Thank for all of us know. women, that you you've uh, made appointments with a mani pedi and a and a massage at the spa. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have one more question 
Hi, Laura. Are there any challenges for the people who want to join the events industry in the U.S.? So we're talking about challenges specific for the U.S. community. Maybe compared to the other part of the world. So uh, the areas where I'm most familiar would be in uh, Italy, uh, Canada, uh, the U.K., um, I think that in comparison, uh, for instance, uh, I read the uh, joint um, JMIC, the Joint Meeting Industry Council, uh, they put together in six months uh, a manifesto for the exhibition and event industry. And I've used that very much in the work that we've done here in the U.S. I also looked at the Italian fairgrounds and they immediately had a program set up for how to make this the, our spaces safer and how to uh, address uh, partnerships with medical industries and for um, organizations. I will say the, the challenge that I can think of in the United States is sometimes that we're so big and cumbersome, sometimes we're slow. And so, uh, we're, we're hoping to provide a solution for that. Um, but uh, other than that, there are no obstacles in the United States for getting into the events industry. Um, if you join our LinkedIn group, we post jobs from all different uh, sectors. We've, we've identified six, um, six major verticals, uh, corporate um, events for uh, occasions, fairs and festivals, political conferences, and fundraising, sports, and uh, performances. So those are six verticals that we're looking at at creating roundtables in, and then yeah. creating uh, each of the jobs and job descriptions so that we can start to um, start to formalize that process and, and be able to provide information for people more readily. So there is a high demand for people in that industry? Yes, very much so. And a matter of fact, uh, in America, uh, to help predict what the U.S. job landscape will look like in the next few years, the Bureau of Labor Statistics identified 40 industries which will see the largest swings in employment between 2021 and 2031. And uh, the top three were in healthcare, professional and business services, leisure and hospitality. Ho leisure and hospitality were the largest growth, 38% in amusement parks and arcades, 39% in event promoters, agents, and managers, 20% in museums and historical sites, 31% in spectator sports, 35% in performing art companies, 23 in accommodations, and 23% in artists, writers, and performers. So huge, huge growth potential uh, until uh, 2031. 31, yeah. We have one more question, which is, I wanted to ask you if you think your strategy and your proposals should or could be applied to other countries internationally. Yes. And in our advisory council, we have uh, representation from Canada and from Italy. Um, and we're seeing some commonalities. They're, they're different words and different shapes, but definitely we're seeing a lot of commonalities and in moving, um, moving the ball forward. Um, and certainly we welcome anybody who is in our industry who'd like to join our advisory council to uh, reach out and we'll, we'll certainly, uh, certainly find room and a space and find out how we can keep our family together support our family and protect our family in the future. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. So any any other questions? You have your last chance to ask Lara anything on her presentation. I am just going to use this time to once again tell you that you have a few more hours to uh, go into your profiles and go through the list of all the participants uh, in the event and to plan and to book your final meetings for today. 
So I don't think we have any other questions, Lara. Thank you very much once again for being with us. I know you have a quite a busy schedule for today. And we're very, very grateful that you find some time to sit with us and speak on this very important topic. So hopefully we'll have you as a guest speaker in the future as well. So yeah, have a wonderful, great day. And I hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you for your help and support. And thank you all for allowing me to be a part of this amazing com community. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.